we're looking at the last battle, so concluding our studies in Narnia, and it's the uh, it's an extraordinary book, and it is not like the others. You might have noticed. It is uh, marked by a very bleak tone throughout, from the or from the early outset, and it begins with the implausible situation of uh, two creatures having a conversation, one by the name of Shift, the other by the name of Puzzle, a monkey or an ape, and a donkey. Um, so the bleakness of the tone, I want to note seven things about it, eight things about it that are um, noteworthy and, and actually in many ways uh, unique compared to the other seventh book. This is the seventh of seven uh, chronicles. Uh, here the tone is bleak and it does not stop being bleak. It is um, without relief bleak. And it is very dependent on something that he's not using elsewhere as a means of expressing his message and that is he uses irony. Irony which requires us to see beneath the surface. Irony which en entails a discrepancy between what appears and what is. Now this is related to the topic and theme uh, I've talked about in relation to the abolition of man, the difference between education and truth on the one hand, which is the reality, and propaganda which conceals it. Propaganda is what the world uses for talking about things without knowing the way things actually are. It does so for political reasons, for the reasons of power. So that's different. There's irony here, there's a subtext, there's an apparent, there's an apparent story going on, and there's another one that is actually going on. So it's different, it's more sophisticated. Uh, third point is there's no quest in it at all. The others have the sense of a quest, even the silver chair, which we concluded with last time, the sixth book. There was a quest. Uh, here, rather than being sent out to accomplish things, we're thrown right in the midst of a war. And the those that are brought into the war are right in the midst of it. It's like being in battle. It's the fog of war. Where we are... Uh, confused by what we see. We can't make sense of what we see. The characters themselves seem overwhelmed by what's happening on around them. Every sign of hope that they uh, draw upon, every sign including the appearance of um, Eustace and Jill, uh, which seems a sign of help, is in fact of no help. There are all sorts of signs of, of help and hope that these will come, that uh, rescue will come. It does not come. Very dark. Contributes to the bleak tone. Uh, fourthly, the main character is an adult. He's not a child. It's Tyrion. When I say he's an adult, he's a young adult. But he's a man. He has, uh, he's, he's described as being muscular. He's a young man who is able to wield a sword. He's got something of a beard. Not a full beard, but enough there to show that he is no longer a child. And he's called repeatedly, and this contributes to the somber tone, uh, he's called the last king of Narnia. Repeatedly, the emphasis that he's the last king. So if we thought that somehow there was going to be a continuation um, and that somehow his dynasty might be perpetuated in some way, there would be another chapter. Uh, the narrator disabuses of that by repeatedly referring to the
the fact that he is the ultimate king of Narnia. And so as the main character, um, the children help him. So Jill and Eustace come to his aid rather than the other way around. Remember, if you think of, we didn't talk about this uh, in, in, in the lectures, but in Prince Caspian, the Pevensey children are called to the aid of Caspian. Right? They're called to help by adults. The children come. Here, the children come to the adults' aid. The one adult and the one adult is in Narnia. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, and, and only they can do, uh, apparently, what is called upon, except they can't do it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to note is that in terms of the trajectory of the story, usually the stories begin with the, uh, this world that we are in, and then they enter into the land of Narnia through some portal of sorts. Is it a wardrobe? Is it a painting? Is it through rings? Is it through some sort of wish being made by, as I say, Caspian, a call out, a cry out that pulls them, draws them from where they are? Uh, but that doesn't hear, happen here. As I say, the, the Jill and Eustace are called to help w way down the road in the middle of the story. And when they get there, they can do nothing. So it comes at the, towards the end of the work rather than at the beginning of the work. So we have the reality, but the reality within Narnia. Narnia itself is coming to an end. The world of Narnia. And only at the end of it do they then leave Narnia and how do they leave it through, again, another implement? What is it? It's like a tent. And it's a dark place and nobody wants to go into it. It seems like it, uh, everyone who goes into that is going to die. It's a, means, it's a means of death. And that appearance, which seems to affect only those that get pushed into the tent, nonetheless holds true for everyone. So again, this is, and this is the seventh mark of distinction, uh, everyone dies. There's no happy ending in, in, uh, in Narnia if everyone ends up dead. And they do. They all end up dead. And until they're all dead, Aslan does not appear. This is the eighth thing. Aslan does not appear until they are all dead. There are calls to, for Aslan to come. The children who have been acquainted with other adventures are used to Aslan coming in some way, providing help in terms of uh, last time we saw the four uh, signs that they are to follow. Here we get from Aslan silence. This, uh, of the seventh books, this is very much of an adult tale. This is how adults experience reality. The others uh, seems like wish fulfillment, very childish tales. The seventh tale is one for grown-up children. Uh, I mentioned last time this really good book, Planet Narnia by Michael Ward. He talks about how the sense of Saturn contributes to this. Um, Saturn, which in the discarded image he says, uh, and I'll, I'll just read the passage, in the earth his influence produces lead. In men, the melancholy complexion or temperament Melancholy, uh, I'll, I'll just read it and then I'll comment. In history, disastrous events. In Dante, his sphere is the heaven of contemplatives. He is connected with sickness and old age. Our traditional picture of father time with the scythe is derived from earlier pictures of Saturn. A good account of his activities in, is in promoting fatal accidents, pestilence, treacheries, and ill luck in general occurs in the knight's tale, he is the most terrible of the seven and is sometimes called the greater 
in fortune, in fortuna maior. If you recall back in the silver chair, we saw Father Time lying down. He will appear here again after everyone is dead. Time is up. History is being wrapped up. And he, Saturn is going to rise. Uh, portrayed in the form of uh, Father Time. It seemed rather odd in the silver chair, but he was already had a sense of how he was going to conclude the, the work uh, in this one. But these uh, eight features, the bleak tone, the reliance on irony as a way of conveying the story, rather than metaphor, uh, there's no quest. We're in the midst of realism. We're overcome by events. We have no sense of perspective. There's no guide. There's no map. There's no leader. The leader himself has no idea what's going on. People call and cry out to him for help. He has no way of guiding them. He himself needs to cry out for help. When he cries out for help, he is not answered. I'll get to that in a sec. I want to make a great deal of that. Uh, the, the main character, number four, is an adult, Tyrion. Uh, Jill and Eustace come to help him. Fifthly, the characters move from the brutal reality of their present to an ideal rather than the other way around. Like the whole of the story is brutal reality. It could be discussing present day life. Things seem to go from bad to worse. Every sign of hope is brought to discouragement. And only at the end of it does the ideal come. Whereas in the earlier stories, the children are in the midst of a war and they go into an uncle's uh, house and escape into an ideal world through the wardrobe. Right at the beginning, but not here. That only comes at the very end. So it's, it's unremitted, unremittingly bleak up until that point. Uh, and the wardrobe, sixthly, the wardrobe or the painting or whatever allows them transport, as I say, only comes at the end of the work. And so that's very interesting because it's the last book. And the means by which to go into the better world comes at the end, the end of life. It's not through the imagination, it's now through the tent of the body being folded up, the last act. And that's signified in the seventh point, unlike all the other ones, everyone dies. Every last one of them, we find that actually back on Earth, they were involved in a fatal accident, even. Right? That was, was that, is this not this one or is that the other? That's uh, earlier. No, it's this one. Yeah. They're dead there and here. Lest we think that this is just, they died in Narnia. There's a death everywhere. It, now the imagina imaginative world of Lewis and Narnia meets the world in which the Pevensies actually reside. There is a direct correlation being drawn. Death is death. It happens there. Connotation of that is that the message of hope at the end also applies to this world. So it's his most evangelistic, if you will, of books. Broadly misunderstood, some people object very strongly to the fact that the children are killed off and everyone's killed off. Philip Pullman hates it. And uh, finally, as I say, in this book, unlike all the others, Aslan does not even appear until it's all said and done. It's over. They're dead. Then Aslan comes. So those features, those are the ones that I think are noteworthy about the story. And now let me say something more about this. And, and note the repeated reference to cold. This is a very cold world. Everyone is shivering cold from poor puzzle having to jump into the cold water at the beginning and, uh, and shift. The monkey doesn't want to go in. Note the uh, allusion to shift as a trousered ape, going back to Lewis's reference in The Abolition of Man to his contemporaries, men without chests. Uh, 
uh, puzzle, uh, or rather shift, says that he, his chest is weak. Right? I can't go into the water. You know me. My chest is weak. You do it. And of course, they're both, they both have weak chests, actually. They're both wheezing. Can't handle it. And they put the cloak of the lion over top of them. Again, the theme of deceit. And there's an irony. People come to worship a false Aslan in that form or also in the uh, terminologically in Tashlan. That perhaps God is character it has changed. After all, he's not a tame lion. Can he not do what he wills? Can the God of uh, grace not also, because he is God, decide that he is going to be brutal because he's God? The characters themselves are in some doubt because they look at the events of the world around him, and even Tyrion, the last king of Narnia, wonders. Perhaps it is so. There's also, and this I get from uh, Ward because I think it's a, an important point here, there's more explicit talk of astronomy in this work than in any of the other ones. So Runewit declares, never in all my days have I seen such terrible things written in the skies as there have been nightly since this year began. I know that my art, by my art, that there have not been such disastrous conjunctions of the planets for 500 years. The stars never lie. If Aslan were really coming to Narnia, the sky would have foretold it. And he says he is not coming. But disaster is coming. And later on, we hear that Runewit the centaur has been shot with an arrow. He is dead. Lies dead with a calamine arrow in his side. We know that uh, his prophecy of doom has come, and it's come to him. He is dead. The prophet is dead. And when he said Narnia is no more, he said it for astrological, astrological reasons. He's read the stars. The stars have foretold the end. Now, I'll read word here. As the entire Narnian cosmos disintegrates, Father Time blows a croning threnody on his horn with a note high and terrible. It is doubtless a goat's horn for the tragedy, literally the goat song, of Narnia's destruction has been wrought by the astrological goat of Capricorn, the zod zodiacal house over which Saturn presides. This is his hour. Saturn overthrows Jupiter, the sign of whose house, Sagittarius, is a live centaur aiming a bow and arrow. Runewit's death and the manner of it indicate that the kingdom first trumpeted six books earlier in jovial triumph has finally collapsed into Saturnine ruin. So, a very dark end. To the book. And so what does Lewis say about the uh, what in scripture uh, Paul calls the last enemy? The last enemy is death. Because here we have death and everything is put to death. Comes to death. Uh, in miracles Lewis notes that death is the great weapon of Satan, but it's also the great weapon of God. Death is also God's drudge. He serves the Lord. Death is given to Adam and Eve, and of course, thereby serves Satan, but also as a means to uh, drive them towards himself to faith in himself. He serves God. He also serves justice. In Lewis's view, no evil can be wholly evil because existence is a good. He gets this from Boethius, this view, by the way. As long as there's life, as long as something exists even, there is goodness because existence itself is a good. Even hell has a limit to it. So there's an, a, in a philosophical sense, there's a goodness to hell because it exists. God created it. 
So when the kingdom of Narnia is brought to its end, Aslan, or Tyrion, makes good use of the constellation of Saturn by uh, seeing things that he before could not see. He becomes contemplative. Remember when I said at the outset in, uh, when Lewis is speaking about Saturn in the discarded image, he talks about it being a place for the contemplatives and also for the melancholic and also imbuing the spirit of tragedy. These are traditional associations. Academics tend to wear black, tend to be, you know, the Dr. Faustus type. They, they are melancholic in temperament. And also, although not in our day, for various relevant reasons uh, associated with wisdom. Today, more often associated with uh, falsehood. But um, he sees things that he could not see before. And what does he see? He sees that the horrid thoughts that he had, which is that all things are coming to end, and end may nonetheless be Aslan's will. Though he cannot penetrate why that might be. So the terrible uh, sense imbuing this entire work of doom, of, of bleakness, of tragedy, is a possibility for a Christological meditation on Tyrion's part. That in the midst of his desolation and he will be abandoned that God is present to him in a strange way and this is a favorite theme of Lewis in his works you'll find the same thing next semester when we if you're with me when we go to the uh, sci-fi trilogy um, Ransom Edwin Ransom who's the hero there is also abandoned he is on his own he has no sense of what to do we saw this actually in, the, in, the, in uh, the silver chair as well. The children did not w know quite what to do. It was not obvious to them. They're, they reasoned about it, they thought about it, and in the end all they had to rely on is the words that Aslan had given them. And the one who is the figure of wisdom there is this silly gardener figure uh, whose name was uh, puddle glum. Now he's glum. He's a melancholic figure. He's w watery. He's morose. He's somber. He never sees the bright side. And, and, that, and he makes, a, 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 actually according to Marsh Wiggles, he's, a, he's very optimistic according to their lights. But I mean we're laughing because everything that he sees is doom and gloom. And yet he is the one who is most uh, like what we find the entirety of the last battle to be like. So he is the adult in the room. And he will not, despite all appearances, go against what he knows to be true, even in the face of, uh, of the reality that confronts him. And he breaks the spell by putting his foot on the fire and burns himself badly. But they're abandoned at that point. We will find his situation replicated here in the form of Tyrion, all that much more so. Because Tyrion uh, fights a battle in which he just simply loses over and over and over. And this is uh, important for all of Lewis's thought. Uh, and numerous writers have noted this. Ward is one of them, but his biographers uh, have noted this, I noted it myself when reading his works, that the passage in scripture that Lewis meditates upon most often is the, um, the dereliction of the cross. Quoting Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, right? It's all over Lewis's corpus of writing, in his apologetics works, in his uh, academic works, in his literature. 
The dereliction is there in his diaries. It's in his literary criticism. It's in his correspondence, if you read his letters. He has a sense of being abandoned in the world in which he lives. The men around him are traitors. They've all turned their backs. The faithful are few in number. And it seems hopeless. The battle seems to be lost. And yet. And we can see it right in the last battle when Tyrion is tied up on a tree. Right? He's helpless. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to see this Christologically, but he's tied to a tree, and anybody who knows what trees like in biblical works is going to immediately think of the cross. And he's tied to the tree. He's not crucified, but he's tied to the tree. And what is he? And he's bleeding, and he can't move, and he's helpless. And what does he cry out? He calls out, Aslan, 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 come and help us now. And what's the response? But the darkness and the cold and the quietness went on just the same. It's a very bleak moment. You expect there's always been a response in the previous stories. He got an answer earlier when um, the two children are sent to his aid. Extraordinary, but the children also have failed. Now he calls on Aslan directly. Aslan does not answer. We can't help but see a, a, an echo or an allusion to Christ, their election on the cross. Now I need to reflect on this, uh, and I want to spend some time to do it because it's important uh, for understanding Lewis, and it's important uh, theologically, and it's important to distinguish two different types of silence. Because Tyrion receives silence in response to his plaintive cry in his desolation. He, get, he gets nothing. He feels, uh, he feels abandoned. And what we have here, uh, and here's what I want to talk about, and I've written it on the board for your help because it's in Latin and, and in Greek. Now I've transliterated it in the Greek at any rate. But in the Latin, we get two traditions explaining what silence could betoken. On the one hand, there is that of the Deus Incognito. Remember, Paul goes to the, um, the Athenians on Mars Hill in Acts 17, and there's the tomb of the unknown God. This is the God you don't know. And on the other hand, there is the Deus Absconditus, the God who's hidden. I want to reflect on this for a few minutes, and I'm going to tease it out. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to spend a few minutes on it because it's, I think it's very important. Um, when the uh, uh, Roman soldiers conquered Jerusalem in 63 BC, they, and they went into the Holy of Holies, they desecrated it. They were shocked to find that there was nothing there. They thought there was going to be, as in the temples of the pagans, they would find all the treasures piled up in the vaults right at the center of it. They found it was empty. There was nothing there. It was a bare room. The most zealous of all religious people in the ancient world, they caused the Romans no end of hardship and frustration. They couldn't break these stubborn people. Um, they had nothing. Where God was, there was nothing there. That, that tradition of the, of the absent God uh, gets picked up in medieval thought. It gets picked up in two ways, these two ways. They're seemingly similar on the surface, and, but they could not be more different. They have in common silence. I wrote my doctoral thesis on silence. which, uh, let me tell you, was uh, a source of infinite grief to me to have to tell people what I was doing. And I told them writing a, a literature um, doctorate on silence. Well, that's not going to be very long, is it? Ha, ha, ha. You know. <laughs> Never heard that one before. Yeah. So I added a little bit to it. Silence and the crisis 
of self-legitimation in English romantic literature, something like that. Um, I thought silence could be construed in different ways, and it was important that uh, the distinction was made. Um, I've since that time thought about it more, and I think I have a better sense of what it could mean. Uh, for those who don't know God, the Deus incognito, the God is incomprehensible. He just, or not incomprehensible, he can't be known. This is, uh, occurs in the medieval tradition. It's not the only one in the medieval tradition. Aquinas will uh, appeal to the Deus absconditus. But in uh, the mystic tradition, uh, there is a sense that probably follows the pagan school of Plato's Academy, and it, it revives itself in the French Enlightenment in the sense that God is unknowable. All the language we use to describe God is inadequate. Jordan Peterson talks this way. He has a sense of the reverence, the importance of God, but he thinks that it's um, arrogant or, um, I don't know, I can't remember, I don't want to misquote him there here, but he has a sense that he, he, he dares not have faith in this way because God is ultimately unknowable. So he falls within that tradition. Now that tradition in, uh, the, uh, in modern times expresses itself in a sort of fundamentally pessimistic, cynical, and Darwinian worldview. Because Darwinian uh, thought explains everything in, in material terms. That we can know, it evolves towards something we can't know. Religion is our attempt to grasp out to God. It's a, it's a plaintive cry out, and the cry is never answered. But it's very pessimistic, it's very cynical, it's particularly cynical about those who adhere to the tradition of the Deus Absconditus, who interpret silence rather differently. In the ancient world, it doesn't end the way it does in the modern world. We've already talked in the, um, that lecture he gave called De Descriptione Temporum about how the pagan world and the Christian world had much in common. More in common than those two do, the, the pre-Christian and the, and the Christian did the, than the post-Christian. The post-Christian seems to have nothing in common. What does it have what does it not have in common, unlike the others? Well, a, a positive view of human nature. The pagans have a positive, positive, if not optimistic, view of human nature. They think that at least there's a spark of the divinity within us. There's something of heaven in the human being. In Ovid's, I, uh, we're created upright. Unlike the other animals who look down to the earth, we're created upright. We look, we look to the heavens where we came from. Whatever its, its origins, I just uh, spoke on this when comparing all of it to uh, Genesis in uh, my first year class. Uh, however different they are, they still have an optimistic view of humanity and also an optimistic view of human rationality and, and its utility. Plato did not have a low view of reasoning, neither did Aristotle. They also thought human beings were distinct from the other animals. In Darwinian thought, we're all animals. And the pretension to be more on our part is just that, it's pretension. It's arrogating something of the divine to us that we have no capacity to understand because the divine is beyond our capacity to know. So it's just a power move on our part. And your contemporary thought is littered with this idea, based on the idea that God is unknowable. With, along with that, they'll deny that scripture is the revelation of God because of God, of course, God could not speak and hasn't spoken. And with that, um, the unknowability of God, the, when I say with that, with that, the post-Christian, having jettisoned the idea that there's something of the divine in human nature, 
theology is reduced to anthropology. That's it. It's just anthropology, and all the religion is just moonshine, as Lewis would call it. It's just something we, a narrative we like to tell about ourselves. And I'm not sure that's far off what Peterson says. It's a narrative that's very useful. It helps hold back the chaos, keeps us on the rails. It, it has a utilitarian function, but that's pretty much it. And he says, it, and it is very useful, and he notes the utility of it, and it is ut useful, by the way. Believing in God is demonstrated by psychologists and sociologists, etc., to lead to human happiness. It's, it's incontrovertible. So it has a utilitarian function. But theology is just reduced to anthropology by this taking. And what it does is then it tells us about ourselves, but it doesn't really tell us anything about ultimate things. It doesn't tell us about cosmology. It doesn't tell us anything about God. Those are realms of, I mean, you may as well go to a, a psychic or a medium as go to a church. Because all of them are talking about the same thing. They don't know. So uh, that needs to be contradistinguished with a, a Christian view. Now, what's the Christian view? Well, I've just identified it as this view of the Deus absconditus. And what do we mean by this, then? By the way, in the, in, in the pagan account of, of Ovid or, or of, of Hesiod, uh, creation is already a kind of fall because we're separated from God just by chance, chaos, accident, and there's a little bit left, but it's already a fall. We're no longer holy, divine, we just have a little bit of the divine in us. It just happens. So there's already a fall, it happens. There's no moral transgression, it's just something that happens as things change. That's not the Christian view. The Christian view is given in scripture. There is a fall that takes place as a result of a, an act of disobedience. So it's a moral transgression that brings about a fall. Not a, it's not the product of creation itself. Uh, what's the difference there? And, and by the way, the attempt in the pagan world to regain that is called enlightenment. How does that enlightenment take place? It takes place through means of philosophy. So we're born in a place where God is distant and unknown, and we have to find him. And how do we find him? We find him by focusing on what is divine in us and shutting out the bit of us that's not divine. What's the bit that's not divine? The bit that's not divine is the material. We focus on the soul. Remember, the view of the ancient world is that, that the soul is imprisoned in the body. The body is like a jail. we got to get rid of that purify it. So they have a, um, in, and this is picked up in the early church in a heresy called Gnosticism. And they, but they call that enlightenment. And the enlightenment recapitulates that. Much of modern um, thinking uh, appears to be a return of Gnosticism. Uh, Martin Luther comes upon this approach and he calls this a theology of glory, a theologia gloriae. Another sort of theology, which is the Theologia Crucis, theology of the cross. The theology of the cross reveals to us now that God is unknowable, but rather that He's hidden. God is not absent from our lives because we can't know Him. It's because we're estranged from him. 
It's not an epistemological problem. It's an ethical problem. It's a, it's, it's a, a soteriological problem. We don't, the reason we don't know him is because our sins have distanced us from him such that we can't know him. And therefore we need a savior. And the savior comes to us not in the form we would expect or call for or hope for as a charger on a horse, as a conqueror, but rather as a sufferer, a suffering servant. So we don't fall out of remembrance, we fall, we've fallen out of favor. God is hidden from us, but he's not unknown to us. In fact, in Romans 1, Paul says that everyone knows that God exists. So they do know. And yet, they flee from him, and therefore they're without excuse. They deny. In unrighteousness, that's what it says, go to Romans yourself. They repress, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So they know, but they deny it. Now, one way of uh, expressing this, as I say, is through the theology of the cross, and I'm going to sort of itemize it in a different way. And so here's the contrast. The hidden God is the revealed God on the one hand, and also the revealed God is the hidden God. So we see God uh, revealed, even though he's hidden to us in his revelation. Though we don't see him with our eyes, we hear him with our ears. In the words of scripture, he is revealed to us. Remember the people who saw Jesus crucified in, in front of them did not think that they were see, seeing God get crucified. It was not until the word was preached to them, until they walked with Christ on the Emmaus Road, that their hearts burned within them and they realized at that point, but they didn't see it then. We, people say, if I could see it, then I would believe. But actually they did see it and they did not believe. They didn't believe what they saw. They believed it when they heard it. It's a supernatural event. It's not something that can be seen. It's not in accordance with the theology of glory. It's not something that you would expect, reason, uh, understand in that sense. But it is something that comes to you in a way that you cannot deny, and yet you cannot explain. And why is that? Because the theology of the cross is wholly contradictory, un uh, incomprehensible to the world. It's not that it can't be known, it's that it cannot be understood. Be it, so what does the world perceive about the cross? It's tied up with the cross. Remember, it is foolishness to the Greeks. And the Greeks are the, are the wise ones, the knowledgeable ones. What does the world perceive in the cross? Know what I've written on the board here? The theology of the cross it involves the great exchange, what theologians call the great exchange. 
It is an unequal exchange in accordance with our understanding when I explained this last time. I'll come to it again. We'll uh, tease it out and look at the complexity of it when we come to the four, the four loves, that one of the three loves is not like the others. One of the four loves is not like the other three. And that is the form of love that we call agape love. It's unmerited favor. There's more to it than that, however. It's true. The first three loves are merited, we, that we love things because they're lovable. Christ loves the unlovable. That's true. But the great exchange is that not only do we get a love that we don't deserve, but we get a lot more than that with it. But the world never understands it. Why? Because at the cross, the world sees shame. There is only shame at the cross. It's just another naked Jew crucified in Rome, in Rome, outside the gate of Jerusalem, outside the city walls. That's what they see. What else do they see? They see a man who is so weak that they mock him, you can't even come down. You said that you could raise the temple in three days, you can't even come down from the cross. They see a man who is helpless. As I say, shamed, he has no clothes. The Jews don't expose their private parts in public. The, Ro the Romans might in bathhouses, the Greeks run around at the Olympian games and so forth. The Jews don't do this, they don't expose themselves. They do this to humiliate them. It's an example, right? The, all bullies do this. We make an example. This is what's gonna happen to you. You go after somebody, you put them down and everybody else falls into line. This man claimed to be king. We'll show you what Rome does to those who pretend to power. We've got the power, there you go. So shame, weakness, it appears folly to the world. What did he die for? Judas is outraged. Peter is outraged. I'm going to go to, the, go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be turned over the elders and priests and I'm going to be crucified. Peter says, you're not going to do that. He says, get behind me, Satan. Peter doesn't get it. This is a, but from the world's eyes, this is the most foolish thing he could ever do. What else do we see? Condemnation. There is nothing worse than uh, being crucified. Roman citizens are not allowed to be crucified. It's a sign of, of, the, of absolute sh scandal and shame. It's reserved for the very worst in Roman society. You crucify them. It perceives sin. Who, who else gets crucified besides sinners? Criminals. He's a bad man. And finally, it sees death. Well, how could it not? Everyone on the cross dies. All of these things are clear. They're actually, none of these things is in any way disputable. Everything that I've said there, the world perceives it that way. That's, and that's all they see. But the truth of the matter is that what the world perceives as shame is the glory of God. It's the means by which he does glory to God. Father, glorify thy name. I'm going to show the world my glory. Not the way the world expects it. It's not. He's not going to drive the Romans out and lead a political revolt. And the Father answers the Son, I will glorify you. And he does. At the weakness, how does this exhibit itself at strength? Well, what happens at the cross? Christ bears the sins of humanity and destroys death because he rises from the grave. What could be stronger than the act of weakness? Is there any act of strength that could do that? You're going to destroy death itself. Remove sin from those who have faith and destroy death. In the moment of folly, which it appears to his disciples, it's the wisdom of God. It's 
Paul talks about it repeatedly. Look at 1 Corinthians. Talks about this. The shame. The folly. And yet, the wisdom of God. In his condemnation, we are acquitted. By the way, this is the great exchange. The sin that he bears, which they see on him, we say is our righteousness. Jesus Christ, our righteousness. Because everything that is attributed to him. So all of the things that I had over on this hand, what the world perceives, the shame, the weakness, the folly, the condemnation, the sin and the death that are our merited judgment. We deserve all of those things. They're all laid on Christ. All of them. And so we, who had those things by nature, receive everything that he had. What did he have? He had glory, strength, wisdom, a good name, the acquittal, and righteousness in life. Christ had all of these things. They, they were a part of his nature. He gives them to us. He takes what's bad in us. He gives us what was good in him. There's the exchange. It's the worst deal ever done. But for the Christian, it's good news. How could it not be good news? So when Tyrion here, and as I say, this is the hidden God. It, it, he's hidden away. Christ himself at the cross or in the Garden of Gethsemane cries out to God, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, yours be done. And he sweat, as I said last time, he sweats blood. He feels the sense of what is about to come so strongly. He has a physical reaction of extreme distress. And when he gets to the cross, he cries out the cry of dereliction. Because why? Because he's God forsaken. He is actually God forsaken. There is one person in the whole of human history who is ever God forsaken. Only one. And he was it. God never leaves you or forsakes you. Anyone, it's not just for Christians, God does not forsake people. What's the response to Tyrion? He called out, Aslan, 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 come and help us now. But the darkness and the cold and the quietness went on just the same. Tyrion persists. What does he say? Let me be killed, cried the king. I ask nothing for myself, but, but come and save all Narnia. And still there was no change in the night or the wood. But there began to be a kind of change inside Tyrion. Without knowing why, he began to feel a faint hope, and he felt somehow stronger. It's immediately there. There's no response. It, it's just silence. But he is somehow in that moment of awareness that there will be no response. So he felt abandonment. He, it was followed by a sense of self-abnegation. The awakening of a contemplative faculty and ability to see something he couldn't see before or perceive it. So by the way, if you can't see these things, you need to shut your eyes to what's going on in the world and you need to open your ears. The gospel is preached. You hear the word. This is the, em this is the emphasis on preaching. Why do we emphasize preaching? Because people hear the word and they can see with their mind's eye, if you will, what they, or the eyes of their hearts, however you want to express it, what they can't see with their eyes. And that gives them a strength. So there's a kind of change. He doesn't know why. It happens somehow. But it's not nothing. And he receives a gift of insight at this point. And with that, There's, there's nothing quite there, but he has a conviction, as it says in Hebrews uh, 11, a conviction of things not seen. But there's a conviction that comes upon him, which was not there before. Uh, this is the highest condition of the human will when not seeing God, not seeing itself to grasp him at all, it yet holds him fast. It's obstinacy and belief, irrespective of everything around him that contradicts it. 
just like Puddle Glum. Puts his foot down on it. Burn it. And that breaks the spell. There's no spell broken here. What does he say? He says, I give myself up to the justice of Aslan. In the name of Aslan, let us go forward. I serve the real Aslan. And he says, I will take the adventure that Aslan would send, for we all are all between the paws of the true Aslan. Aslan to our aid. And likewise, Jewel, the uh, unicorn. They resolve together, both faithful now. And they see that the stable, it might be the door to Aslan's country, and we shall sup at his table tonight. And so they are resigned to what will come, and yet they're hopeful. To the end. In, I don't know if you've read The Problem of Pain. Do you do Problem of Pain in uh, Professor Davis's class? Okay. So I don't do it here for that reason. Uh, in The Problem of Pain, uh, Lewis says that only God can mortify, uh, by which he means put sin to death. Only God can do it. We can't do it through means of, you know, the mortification of the flesh. That doesn't put sin to death. There's a misunderstanding there. The body's not the problem. The body does need to be, it's part of you, it does need to be tamed, if it will, if you will, it's part of you, so it does need to be brought conformity and obedience and so forth, yes, but you can't mortify sin, only God can mortify sin. That seems to be what happens to Tyrion here. His sin is dealt, dealt with. And he accepts the uh, calamities, the pain that he's about to suffer uh, as the will of Aslan. And what is the result of this? We will see when he gets to the other side of the stable. When he stands before Aslan, well done, last of the kings of Narnia, who held firm in the darkest hour. The darkest hour. This is the darkest hour that was ever uh, known in Narnia. Uh, we find something similar in the character of Emeth. Now, let me say something about this, because the color means come in here. We didn't talk about the horse and his boy. Um, as much as I like it, I really do like a horse and his boy. It just doesn't quite fit uh, as neatly into the themes I've put here, so I just set it aside. But Emeth is a Calormene, and the, these are the historic enemies of Narnia. And they worship another god, a god called Tash. And Tash is this monstrous bird that walks like a man and eats people. It's a god of death. He's also the seventh of seventh sons, just like, um, just like Tyrion. So it's interesting. And of course, David was the seventh of seventh son. The word emeth, by the way, means truth, fidelity, permanence in, in Hebrew. And Lewis knows that, of course. Ameth wins through despite the fact that he labors in ignorance of Aslan, and in fact, worships a false god. Lewis suggests that because of his faithfulness to God, even though he had never knew God, that is Aslan, because there is only one God, Lewis makes clear. When I say Lewis, the narrator makes clear. They're not the same. Aslan is angry at the very thought that they were the same. No, we're not the same. But he only knew God through that means, and that will be honored, he says. He's credited, in fact, with worshiping Aslan all along, even though he didn't know it. Now, Lewis, it seems to me, steps out on a precipice here, and I find no warrant for what he says in Scripture. But he's, he's dealing, in a sense, with what I've just talked about, in the sense of the Deus Absconditus, and also with the Theolog Theologia Crucis. They think they're worshiping this God. They're worshiping God faithfully, Therefore, they're worshiping the only God that is can be worshipped faithfully. 
he is not promoting Tashlan or syncretism. He is not saying, and I don't think this, by the way, is uh, with Tashlan or even Tash, he is trying to draw an analogy with Islam. I don't think that's what's going on here. It's a heroic people uh, somewhere from the Middle East, so we associate it, we, it must be Aslan, they have scimitars and so forth, so we could come to that conclusion. But again, um, Islam is not going to be worshiping an idol either, like Tash. So it's a constructed thing. I don't think it's meant to be a direct correlation. I don't see any signs that Lewis is uh, thinking that here either. He's certainly not saying Islam and Christianity worship the same God. That's obvious from the text. But he worshiped something. He worshiped it truly. The name that was given to him was Tash. He was faithful to that. He obeyed the Tao. He loved uh, God with fidelity. He was faithful. It seems a funny thing to throw in there at this point. But I, th I think it's in keeping what he said about the world's perception as opposed to the way things really are. Uh, there are means by which uh, Tyrion is helped, by the way. There's a few that come there when uh, Tyrion early on cries out, O Aslan, O Aslan, if you will not come yourself, at least send me the helpers from beyond the world, and Eustace and Jill come. We also see uh, a centaur that has the ability to foresee what is to come. Uh, we also have a lamb with a sort of innocent wisdom. Remember, the lamb bleats sort of rebuked, give a slap down. But the lamb is brave, where the other creatures are not. It's not Aslan, by the way. It's, it's a figure of that reminds us of Aslan, just like the centaur does to some degree, and just like Jill and Eustace do. They're emissaries, if you were, but they're not representations of Aslan. Uh, likewise, there's water that comes from a white rock. All of these things are uh, agents that suggest God is still aiding them even though he doesn't actually come. And Lewis will talk about it in that sense. So even in the sense of the world not perceiving things, we still, uh, miraculous things do happen which are work as signs that point to this. Answered prayer. But the Aslan proper does not appear till the end. Uh, there's a great phrase in here. Uh, th this is the uh, most direct theological statement that's made. He says that a noble death is a treasure that no one is too poor to die. To buy. A noble death is a treasure that no one is too poor to die. To buy. I said it t wrong <laughs> twice. Death is on my mind. Ruined it. It's such a great phrase. <laughs> And so the worst thing, these things over here, they are repeatedly, like, they look at all of what happens to Tyrion and the kids and the Narnians. They are all put to shame. They appear to be weak. They appear to be fools. They appear to be condemned. They appear to be sinners. And Tash is showing them to be opposed to them, and they're going to die. All of those things are what is appearing to happen. But ironically... And this is what I said at the outset. This is an ironic tale. There's a subtext or a, a different way. We see it this way. Beneath the surface, something else is happening. And the reason we know that is because we already know that Aslan is Aslan, that God is at work. And in the end, it all flips when we go into the stable. And then we go into the stable, and we find that within the stable, my goodness, is a world larger than they could have possibly imagined. What's this great phrase? Let's see if I can find it. Ole. Through 
through the stable door. Begone, monster. This is uh, towards the end of chapter 12. Begone, monster, and take your lawful prey to your own place in the name of Aslan and Aslan's great father, the emperor over the sea. The hideous creature vanished and the Tarkhan still under its arm. And Tyrion turned to see who had spoken. And what he saw then set his heart beating as if it had never beaten in any fight. Seven kings and queens stood before him, all with crowns on their heads all in glittering clothes, but the kings wore fine mail as well and had their swords drawn in their hands. Tyrion bowed courteously and was about to speak when the youngest of the queens laughed. He stared hard at her face and then grasped with amazement, for he knew her. It was Jill. But not Jill as he had last seen her, with her face all dirt and tears and an old drill dress, half slipping off one shoulder. She now looked cool and fresh as fressed fresh as if she had just come from bathing. And at first, he thought she looked older, but then didn't. And he could never make up his mind on that point. And then he saw that the youngest of the kings was Eustace. But he also was changed as Jill was changed. Tyrion suddenly felt awkward about coming among these people with the blood and the dust and the sweat of a battle still on him. Next moment, he realized that he was not in that state at all. He was fresh and cool and clean and dressed in such clothes that he would have worn for a great feast at Care Paravel. Sire, let me make you known to Peter, the high king over all kings in Narnia. No, he had no reason to doubt who that was because it was obvious who it was. The, the, The dwarfs refuse to be taken in. When they get thrown in, they can't see what the others can see. That's also interesting. The dwarfs were reductionists. Even when they hear it, they can't even hear. They can't taste the food. It tastes like rubbish. They can't see the light. They see only darkness. They think they're being tricked. They continue to act as if they stay in the world because their view of reality is like that. This is the view of their education that had led them to, again, a very cynical idea that God cannot be known, and they're not going to be taken in again. So a moment of great high comedy. Aslan himself stands before him, and Aslan says at the end of chapter 13, you see, they will not let us help them. They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison is only in their own minds. Yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. But come, children, I have other work to do. He went to the door and they all followed him. He raised his head and roared, Now it is time. Then louder, time. Then so loud that it could have shaken the stars. Time. The door flew open and out they go. And where is this wonderful passage where it talks about There was once a, uh, when they're talking about the, how huge the stable is and how once the uh, king of the whole world was in a manger's stable. The whole of the universe was in that small place. Anyway, at that point they go further up and further in. We already know what that suggests. But as I say, based on how it began, it's very different than the other stories. Because here we have a sense of finality, because they've died also back in the world. They're in, a, they're in an accident. And now, but they still go further up and further in. So the, what is the world of Narnia? What does it represent then there? It represents uh, stories. It represents the sort of stories that Lewis himself loved, the great works of Western literature, mythologies, whether Norse or Greek, uh, that are sort of like signposts pointing to the undiscovered country that he now shows to the children there, who are now older. Remember, this is seven stories on. The other children uh, have actually passed on, and we've moved to, because they've got too old, they no longer believe in the fairy tales. So here's the life that they live in. The fairy tales suggest a world that 
is better than they can. They love imagining that world, but guess what? Reality is a little bit too stark now. That's, that's not the way things are. I wish it could be that way, but it's not that way. Remember, that's Lewis's own experience. And then he comes to faith because this is a true myth. He understands that, that the reason he loves the old myths is because they reminded him of the one true myth namely the gospel, and that's where the children are now. They don't have to live in Narnia because they're too old for that. They don't need to live in the imaginative realms as delightful as they are because now they can experience the real thing, which is like it. And the reason we love the old Narnia is because it reminded us of this place. So Lewis is giving us, in the end, with this uh, conclusion, a sense of how this work is an apologetic work as well but he does it through story. It worked for him personally. It's how he came to understand uh, the Christian faith. The Christian faith can be rationally defended from various points, but it's more uh, plausibly presented in terms that express the theologia, theologia uh, crucis, which is what he's just given to us here. You can reason about the cross as well, but ultimately it defeats rationality because rationality is the way things can be understood and you can you can defeat objections I think apologetics is very good for that and it can even show you how reasonable the faith is but first you have to believe in order to understand that's the problem it's not a leap in the dark that is the perspective by the way of the deus incognito You're, you know you say to somebody you just need to have faith and they said I can't do that I don't know how you can do that. I wish I wish I could do that, but I'm too intelligent to take that leap. That's what they're saying. They, I, I see all this. Shame, weakness, folly, condemnation, sin, and death in what you say. I wish I could have faith in God because I know that God holds all things together. Yes, I wish I could have that faith, but I can't. That's not how it works. Because the deus incognito is actually the deus absconditus. He's hidden, but he's revealed in the glory of the cross. Anyway, um, I got that, by the way, from Victor Shepard, colleague, former colleague at the seminary, but it's based on Luther. Luther ex expands on this theme. It's there in Aquinas as well, but he makes a big deal of it. But this contrast is extraordinarily helpful, I think, for looking at the problems of modernity and the problems of uh, Christianity in a world that uh, wants to reduce everything to the lowest common de denominator and then build up from there. It doesn't work that way. Anyway, uh, that's it. Any comments, questions at the end? I've taken all your time, so isn't that helpful? Okay, I'll see you next time.